Who is Abraham was? This is a question I don't think I've seen anyone pose, let alone try to answer. It's a little bit like some of the videos I've seen lately where they analyze modern politicians trying to determine whether they tell the truth based on whether their messages are coherent both forwards and backwards. So if somebody is what they call doing satan satanic messages, they will have something satanic embedded in the message when you play it backwards and it won't be the same message as what you hear when you play forwards. So I'm trying to apply this to a passage in the book of John where Jesus has having a dispute with the, with the Jews. And I think it's John 8, 28. He says, before Abraham was, I am. This is easiest to interpret in the context of Jesus being a deity because he has this eternal existence before Abraham is born. But in reverse, it takes on uh, more meaning, I think, because you have to ask the question, if Abraham went on to be something else after he stopped being Abraham, what would we call him? In, I think it's Hebrews 7.3, they talk about a priest of the order of Melchizedek as somebody who has no beginning and no end, no father, no mother, no genealogy. This is a complete reversal then of what we know the most about Abraham because he, after a long delay, eventually became a father of nations. He was the father of this vast number of people. Now, suppose in Genesis 14 when he meets Melchizedek and he's blessed by Melchizedek, this being a unique event essentially for anybody in the Bible. If he took on the blessing of, of Melchizedek, that would not be someone who has lots and lots of children like the blessings of the other gods. And Melchizedek's blessing takes a much different tone than that of the deities. Because when Elohim or Yehovah promise him something, they say, I will bless you. There's an identification of who's doing the blessing and what's going to happen in the future. The blessings are always described in the future tense. So we don't, they're done in the form of prophecies. Even though Abraham is said to be a prophet, he doesn't really prophesy anything himself in these passages. The prophecies are done by the deities saying what will happen to Abraham and how many descendants he'll have and how they'll be blessed. Now, when Melchizedek meets Abraham, he does not say directly who is doing the blessing. He just said, be, be blessed. Blessed be, Abraham. And he does it in the present tense. Everything Melchizedek says of importance is in the present tense. So he is an I am. So how does Abraham go from being a regular person to being an I am? Either he had, there could be two of him like there are in other preceding parallel genealogies of the Bible and these genealogies seem to converge upon Abraham in a way because there are there's a genealogy with some names in common with the official one where people's dates of birth and death aren't given much like what happened in the genealogy leading up to one of the alternate Noahs and then there's the genealogies where everybody's um, ages and dates when they had their inheriting sons are given and the, and the time the dates and the ages they were when they died are also given. There's also two versions of that particular gene genealogy. There's one in Genesis and then there's one in the New Testament that are not quite the same. There's an extra Canaan, an extra generation put in in the new generation in the New Testament version. And since my last video on this subject, I've looked up some other ones and there are people who go through the Bible and make messages or try to make messages because everybody in the genealogy has a name that has a meaning. They're all named for what they do or well, what their character is supposed to be. And you can string these together and try and make sentences out of them. So the meaning then that these people use is preferred to be the one from the New Testament when they string the whole story together. They, they like to use the Canaan apparently. So in that way it makes sense and you wouldn't want to throw it out although other people would say it's an error for that. When you look at the genealogy just before Abraham, there's a reason why it might be confused in the time of the Tower of Babel, because that's when, if you look at one of my previous videos, they were confusing, Yehovah was confusing people's knowledge of their genealogy and who they descended from 
and, who, and what they wanted to be proud of in terms of who they descended from. So he says, you know, these people are getting too powerful, they're thinking too much of themselves, wanting to make a name of themselves, and it confuses the genealogy. So there's a reason why in those succeeding generations there might be an apparent error, because the error is actually being deliberately introduced. It's part of the story, it's part of the narrative. But in any event, I would think those two have to work that way because when the genealogies arrive at Abraham, they converge. And after Abraham, there's only one succession of generations described for the next while, unlike in previous ones where you could take snippets of, of two parallel stories from each genealogy. So what happens then to the second Abraham if there is one? I think he could be the one who goes on the alternate path hinted at in the book of John when Jesus has his dispute. Because for somebody like Abraham who who is both willing to be the father of nations and willing to give it all up by having to live all his life with no hope of having any, any sons of his own and then showing willingness to sacrifice his son when he gets the preferred son he wanted there could all he could also have been picked in a way to essentially give up and drop out of the whole genealogy process altogether. A way to do this would be to become a priest of Melchizedek, somebody who essentially lives in the present, has no beginning, no end, no father, no mother, no descendants. So if Abraham went on, and all rightfully speaking should have been renamed again, he was first named from Abram to Abraham when he had made his first covenant or one of his covenants with God, then what happens if your name is Abraham, you're named for being this father of nations, and then you go on, or you're an alternate version of the guy who was the father, the father of nations, you have the same name as him, but you give it up and become a priest of Melchizedek, or you become blessed by Melchizedek and, and gain the same benefit of Melchizedek, which is an indestructible life. Then you would no longer fit the name Abraham. You would be an Abraham was. You'd be an ex former Abraham. And it would be confusing the issue in that context to refer to that guy as Abraham. Jesus comes in and a big part of his ministry is to become a priest of Melchizedek. It's to become a mortal so he can be an intermediary between mortals and the gods. And he does this by taking on the ministry and he hasn't quite completed it at the time he's talking to the Jews in John 8. So he's at a similar stage to what Abraham would have been at if Abraham had gone on to become a priest of Melchizedek. So there's a lot of other ironies in this passage. There's a number of things being seen in reverse where people are just discounting one possibility of interpreting what Jesus says because it seems too impossible. This is like the, the Sherlock Holmes analogy. Sherlock Holmes is ironically based on a doctor, someone whose ultimate mission, if he could do it, would be to keep people from dying altogether, would be to heal all disease, even raise them from the dead or make them young again, if he could do it. Now, Sherlock Holmes's famous saying, of course, is that once you've eliminated the impossible, everything else that remains, however improbable, must be the truth. That's how I figure out the truth. But what if you can't eliminate the, po the impossible? In fact, the impossible is the key to understanding. There's a, a, a quote made with reference to establishing Abraham's genealogy that nothing is too hard for the Lord <laughs> when he's about to give Abraham or say as he's about to allow Sarah to become fertile and to impregnate her so that Abraham Cam can have his preferred child. Also, when Jesus says that you may be descended from Abraham and you don't act like Abraham, you're not effectively his sons, then I think that's once again hinting at Abraham's job of first having this genealogy and then not ascribing a particular amount of importance to it, giving it up. The dispute is that the Jews say we are good, we are proper, we're free, which is really strange too because they 
their, Abraham's descendants spent 400 years in slavery in Egypt and another while in captivity in Babylon. So that's kind of a strange thing for them to say is that they're, they've never been in, in, in bondage. But the dispute is that they derive their righteousness by being descended from Abraham. And Jesus says, well, I'm here to give you this word and you, you want to kill me because of it. And that's not what Abraham would do. This is a very strange thing to say in some ways because Abraham was told in direct parallel to what God says also in the book of John, take your only son that you love and go out and, and sacrifice him to me. And Abraham didn't refuse. He was about to go through with it. So it's a parallel, although he believes that Isaac, in the context in which he's acting as a a uh, stand-in for God, a friend of God, a uh, co-experiencer, someone who does what God does, he's, he's there killing his, his own son, his only son, as God would put it, for the sake of that experience. So the Jews then are put in the same position as Abraham, in a manner of speaking, because they, they want to kill Jesus, or he says he, that they want to kill him, because they don't believe he's the son of God. Nevertheless, their actions end up being the same as Abraham's, if only for the opposite reason. The question becomes, if they really knew and believed that Jesus was the Son of God, would they kill him anyway in order to emulate Abraham? So oh, there's this uh, get killed if you aren't, get killed if you are dilemma. And the way out of that, as I see it, would be for them to accept the word that your mission is to become like a priest of Melchizedek and remove yourself from the problem of succession and genealogy altogether.